Hi, young geographers. This is Ms. Wildy. I'm doing a video lecture over Chapter 1 in the hopes of uh, helping you recall information for your first test. Um, chapter 1 is somewhat an overview of geography and specifically human geography. You can kind of look at dividing up the chapter in the sense of looking at scale and, and maps. Um, reading maps, as well as five themes, types of regions, types of cultural diffusion. And then we kind of end on the um, question of looking at whether or not geography impacts humans more or whether humans impact geography more. So um, uh, first question is, what is human geography? And again, I can put up the, the textbook definition of it, but if you want a simple um, answer to what is human geography, it's going to be how do humans interact with the earth? What do they do with the earth? How does the earth impact them or, or, um, or affect them? Um, how do humans interact with each other? Um, and it's also the perceptions that we make about us, the earth, and others around us. Um, we start with a field note about Kenyan coffee plantations. Um, every chapter begins with a field note. This one in particular is the author who goes to a Starbucks talking about how he buys a, 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 a cup of Kenyan coffee and then he knows he's going to be doing a lecture about them. Um, the key point from the field note is about how food is not distributed evenly around the world. Um, in the case of Kenya, where many, of Ken many Kenyans are malnourished, they don't have enough food, um, it doesn't make sense because they have lots of arable land. They should be able to grow plenty of food for, their, for themselves. But the fact of the matter is that um, because of the way history has worked, most of the land of arable land is used for growing cash crops like coffee, tea, sugar, those kind of things. And they are also owned by foreign companies, which means the profit and most of the um, reinvestment goes to foreign countries, not Kenya. So. Um, the disparity or the or the um, the hardships that the world is having don't necessarily mean it's easy to understand that oh if they have little Larabal in then they must be mal malnourished it doesn't always work that way I also want to remind you of of the instance of Norway and Bangladesh in the sense that Norway has four percent arable land yet they're very rich from other industries and so they can import their food and they're not malnourished whereas Bangladesh has seventy percent arable land Yet because the monsoons come and, and devastate the land every year, there's not enough food for people to eat. Um, globalization is a huge concept from this chapter, and of course it's a huge concept for this entire course. Um, it's, the, it's the interconnections, interrelationships, interdependence, I think that's the key word there, interdependence, um, of all the countries of the world. Um, and these lead us to these unevenly distributed um, resources. There are all of these uh, relationships between those that have and those that have not. Um, and because of the relationships between countries and governments specifically, it also has a part to play in whether a country will do well or not. And we're going to talk about this throughout the year. We really made a point this chapter of talking about how your life and your parents' life has changed drastically within the last 50 to 100 years. Um, and that, that the connections between countries in the world are going to be much more um, fast and, and um, um, leave an imprint much more. Um, I think one of the biggest things here is thinking about products that we get from other countries. And so if a country that we get a lot of products from, like let's say um, coffee, for example, if we get lots of coffee from Indonesia, um, if Indonesia has a natural disaster and its coffee plantations are devastated, we are impacted by that. Even though we have no contact with the tsunami itself, for example, the or the natural disaster, um, it still impacts us because we, we buy from Indonesia. So that's globalization too. It's the good things in terms of getting information really, really fast, but it's also the bad things in terms of we're dependent on others for certain things. And when they're, um, then they have a, a devastation, it affects us as well. Um, geographic inquiry focuses on the spatial. Remember I said whenever you see the word spatial, you should think of space, and in this case an area, not outer space. Um, 
and we are always looking at the arrangement of people, of um, resources, the human and the physical, um, in relation to each other and how we organize ourselves on Earth as a result of that. And that's something that, again, we're going to talk about throughout the chapters of this course. Um, specifically, they talk about spatial, spatial distribution in terms of the map of cholera that Dr. Snow came up with um, in London in 1854. Before this, they did not know how cholera was spread. Um, and because of Dr. Snow's mapping of the cholera cases, and then looking to see where the predominant um, predominance of cases were and what else happened there, Dr. Snow could figure out that, hey, there's a whole lot by the Broad Street pump, the water pump. And so he made the connection that possibly people are spreading it to each other through the water system and that there's a con contamination of that water pump. And that's how we realized that cholera is a waterborne disease. It helped, you know, for the future of, of medicine, where cholera is no longer an, an, um, a major disease of our country because we know we need to keep our, our water treated. Um, so the mapping, again, and the distribution of these cases helped us to develop um, a different way of living. Um, five themes of geography, location, human environment interaction, region, place, and movement. Location should always make you say, where is it? And specifically, the two types of location are absolute and relative. Absolute will always use latitude and longitude, the coordinates that you see. It is this precise place on the map that that place is located, or where is it? Relative location is a little more general. It's a little more broad. Um, where is it in relation to other places? It is, for example, Georgia is north of Florida, or Gwinnett is approximately 20 miles from Atlanta. It's giving you a relative location, and you can pretty much, you know, understand where it is in that um, capacity too. Place, you should ask, what is it like there? And that, you know, what are the physical as well as cultural, like human-made features to a place? So if you went there, what would you see? Would you see tree? What trees would you see? What, if there are rivers, are there mountains? Are there um, um, other, you know, physical features? And also, of course, the human features, the roads, the schools, the malls, the type of food you would see, the languages spoken, the clothing worn, all of that as well. All of that is place. And, it, and to further along that, we have the idea of the sense of place, that we infuse a place with our memories of what happened there or what we associate with that with that place and it gives us a sense of, of, of emotion about that place um, and, a, and a perception is also um, maybe not based on memory specifically but it can be based on what we've heard about a place um, what we've read about something like that um, these are two we didn't really talk about these very much in the um, in class, but these are two maps that were in chapter one about people's pr uh, preference for where they want to live. Um, and the uh, the top map is where Pennsylvanian students prefer to live, and you'll notice, of course, Pennsylvania is in the darker percentage, as well as a little bit of the coast of California. And then the bottom map is the where Californian students prefer to live, and again, it's California. Um, we prefer to live pretty much we prefer to live where we live um, and you'll notice that both Californians and Pennsylvanians do not want to live in the south there's a negative um, perception of that those places um, um, we we tend to prefer coastline um, and either the east coast or the west coast um, and I don't you know we didn't really talk about this but I, I want you to think about doing a little brief survey and see if that applies if we ask students in Georgia. Would they say the same thing? Would we say, we want to live in Georgia, but we don't want to live in the rest of the South, and we'd rather live in like California or New York or, or New England? Um, because I think you probably will find that most people prefer those coastlines or the place they're living, not the borders that, that, that um, lie around them. Um, another theme of geography besides location and place is movement. And we need to remember that this is not just how people move, but also goods, services, and ideas, and how they spread. 
And so the spatial interaction, again, spatial means space and area, the interaction within a space, what happens there, interconnection between places, and, and that can be based on distance. It can change based on distance. Accessibility, how accessible are these goods to people? How accessible um, is the transportation networks that are connecting people? And, of course, um, connectivity. So how connected are they? Um, along the same lines of, of place and movement, you have the cultural landscape. And again, people moving to a place, they leave their mark, the cultural landscape is going to share with you what that culture finds important. So for example, here, um, when you go through India, you will find lots of crematoriums rather than cemeteries. Because for a Hindu, the act of cremation of the, of the body is much more important than burying it. Um, and so there would be a much more prevalence of crematoriums in the landscape rather than cemeteries. Um, and along the same lines are sequent occupants. When you have multiple groups of people that occupy um, one particular country, city, even an area of a city, if you have those imprints that each group has left, you will see their um, lasting, their sequence, sequent occupants. So, Remember, it has to be multiple groups of people, but they're leaving their mark on the city, and that's still evident um, later on. So you can see all the past groups that have, that have left their mark. And we talked about um, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in response to this, and they also talk about Athens, Greece here in terms of the ancient with the modern. So you see the, um, the ancient buildings right next to a modern building. And that's not necessarily two separate groups, but again, the ancient the ancient Greek were were a huge dif different culture group from modern Greeks. So, so in a sense, it is. Um, so here's Dar es Salaam. Again, it's um, um, showing you uh, on the left an apartment complex in Mumbai, India, and on the right an apartment complex in Dar es Salaam. And you'll notice that. I mean, if you remember, there were Indian, there was Indian influence in, in Tanzania. So, um, of course, they're going to bring the style of architecture they're used to in Mumbai with them to Tanzania, and that's what that's showing you. All right, um, two types of maps. Um, we didn't talk about this too much, but I do want to focus on thematic a bit. So, reference maps and thematic maps. Reference maps show locations of places, geographic features, um, and they'll often, oftentimes have the latitude and longitude features on them. Thematic maps um, tend to focus on one particular attribute, say, for example, population distribution or um, water pumps to, br to bring up Dr. Snow and his, and his, um, in his maps. Um, and you really want to look at one particular theme or idea on a thematic map. Whereas a reference map, you're probably using it for multiple uses, um, where you see, you know, lots of different uh, places, how they're connected, like by roads. Um, you might use it for um, telling distance. You might use it for, um, um, you know, just looking at where a place is. You just don't know where they are and you find it. But that's a reference map and then thematic maps have a have much more specific purpose. Um, so here's a reference map of Chicago and here's a thematic map which is a much more um, specific for um, household income by census tract. Remember we talked about this is an even smaller unit than zip codes. Um, and you can tell a whole lot from looking at this in terms of income, where the richer parts are versus the poorer parts. Um, whereas you're not going to really be able to tell that from a reference map. That's just going to tell you there's Chicago and there's um, Michigan City, for example, and how close they are. Um, and you might use it to find which roads connect them, but otherwise you're not going to be able to see one particular aspect too much. Um, the other types of maps, maps that are mentioned are mental maps. And these are maps that we, again, carry in our mind of places we've been and places we've heard of. We make perceptions. We have perceptions about places um, based on those. Um, 
And we tend to use them when we're giving directions. So if we say, um, you know, you're going to uh, turn left out of the parking lot and you're going to turn right at the McDonald's, you're visualizing it in your head and that's what you're using, a mental map, in order to give directions. Um, the other term is activity space, which we didn't really talk about too much, but again, it's going to be um, an area in which we, we participate with activities. Um, meaning, you know, where we go to the grocery store, where we go to um, work out, where we go to school, all of those are activity spaces. So this is an um, example of the geographic information system. Let's see if I can move this a lot of your way. Um, and it would be GIS. And you remember these use thematic maps and they layer them. So you have, um, for example, this, this uh, layer might have the parcels. This is the zones, floodplain, wetlands. And, and what you're doing is you can look at multiple themes and see the best place to locate something. So oftentimes this GIS is used for ur by urban planners to planners, excuse me, planners to decide where the best place to put something is or build something. Um, remote sensing is when geographers look at um, an area that's been affected by geography in some way. And they're, they're somewhere else. They are looking at a satellite image, for example, um, or a Doppler radar, for example. And they can tell something about what's happening without actually being there. So they're using remote sensing. Um, and there's an example of like devastation um, um, after Hurricane Katrina and how um, um, that's an aerial photograph. And you can tell a whole lot about the areas that were impacted and how much and all of that. And that's, but, but it's not, Necessarily, necessarily that the geographer has to be there in order to see it. They can use the photograph and, and tell a whole lot. All right, um, scale. Um, we look at the impacts that things have. We, we look at um, um, how something on the local scale can affect the global scale or vice versa. It can both work both ways. Again, when we have this idea of globalization, it's important that we're looking at, the, at, at different scales to see the impacts. So, so a natural disaster on the local scale can be devastating, but it can also, um, you know, tell us a whole lot about the impact it's going to have on the global scale in terms of the goods that are traded with that country. Um, Local is going to be more like your your state or your city. Regional would be much more of your region of the country. Of course, the nation, your national, um, your country, and then global is the world. And it's just important that we look at the different scales because if we're talking about um, like, you know, we were looking at the household income. If you look at it based on um, census tract, you can tell just just which areas of the DC area have larger or higher incomes. But you can't necessarily extend that, that rationale into the entire state of Maryland or West Virginia or Virginia. You, when you look at the with the United States, then you look at per capita gross income and you can tell where um, states are that have darker, higher incomes. And you'll you know that 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 in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that even though most of the country is somewhat in the in the low or even um, middle, doesn't necessarily mean that that extends into the whole world. Because when you look at the whole world, then the United States is all of the high income. So again, it, you have to kind of tell which scale you're at to really tell, tell what's going on. Um, and it's very powerful because you can influence one another by telling, by, by saying something, but then it only being one scale. So we need to be careful when we're looking at, at geographers and how they're, they're telling us the impacts are and what kind of scale that is. Um, does that really move into the global scale or vice versa? Is it global and we need to look at it at the local? Um, all right, so we back up just a bit with the five themes. We've talked about location and place and movement. And we've also talked about human environment interaction, even though there wasn't really a subtitle. When we talked about um, using remote sensing and talking about the impact of the environment on, its, on people and scale related to that. So the final um, 
theme of geography is regions. And there are three types of regions. Formal, clear, distinct boundaries. You know when you've entered it and you know when you've left it. Um, everyone would be able to identify it the same way on any map. Um, and just remember with formal that it can be strict boundaries like, you know, countries, states, um, even physical features like oceans, but it can also be cultural features. So like the German speaking region of Europe is a clear formal boundary. Um, a functional region has a clear purpose and it has to do with what happens there. That's the whole reason it was produced or, or, or um, created. Um, so again, this is going to be things like a city, um, a mall, a school, a, um, a transportation network, like an interstate. All of those are functional regions. And the last type of region is a perceptual region. And this, again, is going to be somewhat fuzzy. It's going to differ based on who you ask. So the Middle East, um, down there, or out west, or... Um, um, Latin America, those are all perceptual regions. They should have overlap in terms of where it is. People should have a basic idea of where it is, but the definitions aren't going to be quite so clear cut. So these are perceptual regions of North America, and what that means is that this is sort of what, um, you know, what some people have thought to be um, the different areas. But if you ask someone else, they may come up with a little bit different um, movement. Like it may be you know, the Southwest for some people um, may um, include all of Texas, not, not these parts that are part of South or the Gulf. Um, Midwest might come over into, the, into more of the Central Plains area. Um, it just depends on who you ask, but that's what perceptual regions are about. Um, the meanings of regions also give you a whole lot of idea. Um, um, for example, like Confederate um, soldiers or Confederate leaders, um, you're going to find those names much more in the South, of course. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about um, Martin Luther King Jr. boulevards and where you're going to find those. Those are predominantly in the Southeastern region. Even though the whole country would have um, would have known who, who MLK Jr. was, the fact is he was he was known in the South for his for his speeches for his talk and because of the civil rights movement in the South. So that plays a whole lot, long, whole lot to do with how we name places. All right, um, culture, last big section here. Um, we spend a whole lot of time about culture. So, I, so this is just sort of a brief little overview and then we get much more in, into this when we get into chapter four. But, but first of all, um, some key terms are culture trait, culture complex, and culture hearth. And I think culture hearth should be the first thing we talk about. It's where a culture trait originates, the hearth. Um, and this term comes from the um, idea we have of a fireplace. Um, the fireplace used to be the center of the home. It kept everything, kept everyone warm. It was your heat source. It was also your cooking surface. You didn't have ovens or stoves, so you cooked on the on the fireplace. So it's the hearth is the center of the home and it, it really was invaluable. It was so important for the house to survive. And so the hearth for a culture trait is the heart of it. It is where it begins and it, you can't really associate that trait without its hearth. And a culture trait is any sort of attribute of a culture. So the language, um, we use a fork and knife, that's a culture trait. We um, um, you know, the, the activities that we, we um, feel strongly about, those are going to be culture traits. Um, the foods that we consider to be appropriate to eat versus those that don't, all of those are going to be culture traits. And when we combine two or more culture traits together and they intertwine together, that gives us a culture complex. So if you remember in, in class we talked about the fact that um, we like football. Americans like football. And we have whole parties devoted to watching a football game. Those together give you a much bigger idea um, of the impact that football has on, on American culture. That's a culture complex. Um, and diffusion is the spread of culture traits, how it disseminates into the, um, out of the hearth and into other areas. Um, barriers. Um, uh, cultural barriers or physical barriers can prevent um, diffusion, full diffusion. So um, physical barriers can be like mountains or, or oceans or things that are going to prevent the movement of the, of the information. 
cultural barriers are tend to be things like languages or religions where you can't communicate and, and spread the culture trait or you um, the religion has a belief that's that um, won't allow something to happen um, time distance decay is a, a concept um, it doesn't really apply a whole lot anymore but we still refer to it because in some areas it does apply and that just means that with the further the distance, the more decay of information there will be. So it's less likely that a culture trait will diffuse into that area. So there are two types of diffusion, expansion and relocational. I spelled that wrong, I apologize. Expansion, diffusion, um, you do not have to get up and move. The idea or the trait will diffuse without people relocating. Relocational, of course, is that people have to move to a new place for the culture trait to spread. And within expansion diffusion, you have three types under that. So there's contagious, which goes to anybody and everybody it can. It doesn't choose people. Um, hierarchical, which means it does choose certain groups to go to first. Um, oftentimes, it's those with money, or it can be certain age groups. Um, I always you know, want to stress that, that fashion, music, technology, those are all going to be hierarchical diffusion. Um, and then stimulus is where something has to change about the culture trait for it to be diffused. Oftentimes this is because it's come up against a cultural barrier like religion and it has to diffuse, uh, has to change something about it before it can diffuse. So here are some, um, some, some pictures that kind of help a little bit. Again, you have the hearth at the middle, um, an early diffusion, if you notice contagious, it's going everywhere, everywhere it can within, uh, right around the hearth. And then it will, later diffusion will go outside of that. Um, whereas in hierarchical, there's the hearth, it only goes to certain areas first. And then it might go to other areas right beyond that, and it might skip over other areas, because these groups here are not as um, likely to accept it, for example. Um, so it'll skip over before it might come back to those groups. Stimulus diffusion, the biggest example there is the McDonald's in India. That's what this is in reference to. Again, you know, Hindus do not eat meat. They, um, they definitely don't eat beef, but usually they don't eat meat at all. And so McDonald's had to um, change their products to um, um, have vegetable products or soy products. Again, not beef, not meat. And then it was fine. You can find McDonald's all over India now. In terms of relocation diffusion, it's the movement of individuals who then bring their ideas with them and help disperse them that way. Um, so um, again, this, the pictures here are in reference to the idea, again, of crematoriums for Hindus. Um, many Hindus have come to Paris, and we'll, we talked a little bit um, about the migration from um, um, northwest uh, Africa, um, um, they're also going to, um, um, actually I think this this looks like it's more of a Muslim, so a mosque from, from North Africa, excuse me. Um, so it's going to be that relocation, um, oh I see, this is in Kenya, the Hindus into Kenya and the Muslims into Paris. But again, it's a relocation of those individuals that bring their culture traits, apologize. All right, so geographic concepts, ways of seeing the world spatially. Um, it's conceptual. It's an idea. And so geographic concepts are the ideas that are um, found spatially around the world. All right, so there's two um, sort of schools of thought that we kind of focus on in Chapter 1, um, which are somewhat outdated. Environmental determinism um, says that where you're born determines your success and you really have no um, nothing to do about it. It will all, it will determine whether you are successful or not. Possibilism is in response to that which says um, yes environment matters but it's the choices we make with our environment that will determine whether we succeed or not. The new approaches to human environment seem to be more like how our culture affects um, ecosystems or, or the environment around us or how our politics affects um, the ecosystem or the environment around us and less so with this this definite it has to be one way or or not um, much more openness to accepting that there are differences among us and differences for reasons why we do things and um, and how we 
you know, use our um, individualities to impact um, our culture and our politics and things like that. So that is it in a nutshell. Good luck with, um, with the test, studying and all that. Please, please, please feel free to come talk to me about questions you have about this, um, questions on your study guide, anything like that. I'm here um, at 6.45 every morning, and I do not leave until at least 3.30 every afternoon. So um, I'm here for you, so come talk to me. Thank you. Bye.